and I think we're ready to start the show. So my name is Dr. Pamela Gay. I'm this week's host of CosmoQuest's Weekly Science Hour. This is uh, our time to try and bring you something new, something interesting, something exciting, something that you can hopefully find a way to engage in from the world of astronomy and space science. I co-host the show Alternating Weeks with Emily Lakdawalla, and she will be here next week. And we encourage you to come back, same time, same place, every week, to keep learning new things. Now this week, um, I'm going to bring you some wonderful information about, well, plans to go to the moon and how teenagers can get involved today in finding out what's involved in the process. So with me, I have Leah and Leo and Chanda, and I'd ask the two of you to please go ahead and introduce yourselves. Oh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Shonda Gonzalez, and I'm with the Google Lunar X Prize, and I am the education manager for the prize. And I'm Leo Camacho, and I'm the social media and outreach uh, person for the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, so I do all the fun stuff. He's the guy in bed in the code. Yeah, I'm, which I'm doing currently. <laughs> so I'm yeah, every show starts with, there's nothing like programming with an audience who's watching you. Yeah. Um, it keeps it interesting. So, so the reason I ask you on this week is um, you made an interesting announcement of an upcoming date and the Moonbots competition. And, and I'd love to promote Moonbots. And um, if I can start by asking you to explain to people who don't know, and I can't imagine who doesn't know, but explain to those who don't know, what is the Google Lunar X Prize? And then we're going to get to Moonbots. Okay, sounds good. So the Google Lunar X Prize is basically a $30 million contest for the first private um, team to send a robot to the moon. So that's the quick way of saying things in, in one short sentence. Um, currently, we have 26 teams right now from all over the world that um, are trying to build their robots like crazy and um, send them to the moon. We um, are busy right now planning our team summit where these 26 teams will come together and meet. Um, we're all going to be meeting face to face at the end of May um, in Washington, D.C. So we're, we're really, really excited about that. And if anyone's going to be planning on participating at GLEX, we're also going to be there as well. Um, one other place that we'll be um, at uh, attending and hopefully showing off um, some of our robots and the teams is we're going to be in Maker Fair in San Francisco. And so if you want to follow us and kind of learn more about the program and where we're going to be, um, I'm going to let Leo take over and uh, tell everyone how they can get more into information about us. Okay, one, one second though. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the whole programming live while talking. It really, really challenges how much each of us are able to, to multitask. So, so while Leo codes, I, it, it's, I, I love how simple you make it sound. You go to the moon. Um, now, now the truth is this, is, this is actually slightly more complex than just getting to the moon. It's, it's get to the moon safely. That's, that's always involved. You can't simply crash something at, at uh, nasty velocities into the surface of the moon. Once you get there, there's a little robot that has to rove or walk or do what it roll, do whatever the robot chooses to do, going 500 meters. Um, so think five football fields, basically. It's more than five football fields, but basically five football fields. And um, then send back video. So you can almost imagine one of the Sony robot dudes going, landing, walking the 500 meters, not that a two-foot robot usually can walk that far, and then like dancing and sending back a video of dance. That would count. There's no purpose to doing that, but that would count. So, so <laughs> what was that? It would still win, though, even though it wouldn't serve much of a purpose to have the robot dancing on the moon. It would be awesome. It would be, fun. It would be truly awesome. It would. <laughs> So, so robots are the way of the future, and um, how can people connect with you and your future lunar robots and learn more about robots? Well, uh, social media is always the easiest way. Um, so there's always our Facebook page, which we would really appreciate uh, you visiting, because we do post news on there all the time. Uh, and it's a nice open forum for conversation. Uh, so that would be uh, facebook.com slash Google Lunar X Prize, and that will take you directly there. Uh, and then there's also our Twitter account, which is very simple. It's at GLXP. Uh, and we're constantly tweeting news and retweeting some of the team's updates. From there, you'll be able to find each individual uh, team's uh, Twitter pages as well as we tweet them. Um, 
And of course, there's always the main website, uh, which is www.googlelunarxprize.org. Uh, and each team has an individual page there, and you can you can add favorites, and uh, you can kind of see what the rover designs are going to look like. Uh, it's it's pretty cool. It's very interactive. Um, but that's those are probably the main. And of course, Google Plus. So. Of course. Mm -hmm. Now, no one of the awesome things about the X Prize programs is the the organizations that compete in these prizes. They aren't multinational uh, governments necessarily. They're Sometimes just small groups like Scaled Composite, which won the Anasari X Prize for, for going up twice in a limited period of time. What types of diverse groups are currently signed up for the X Prize, the, the Nurex Prize? So we have some amazing teams. I mean, like I said, we have teams from all over the world competing. I'll just name kind of a couple. Um, we have universities that are involving. Penn State is involved. Um, and then we have, you know, the mad rocket scientists <laughs> involving. Those are my favorites. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And we're really looking forward to the, the team summit because this is where all of the cultures kind of come together and we get to learn about, you know, what everyone is doing. And, I mean, there's there's guys as young as 18, 20 years old to, gosh, yeah, you who have, knows, you probably have all, in their 70s. There, you there, know, is no, there is no exact demographic. I mean, you get all kinds yeah. of people. And, and like you were saying, it wasn't, uh, you know, it's not governments competing um, to do this. But, in fact, an interesting thing is a lot of teams are competing to raise awareness uh, for their government so that they can have a space mm -hmm. program like our Malaysian team, for example. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It, it's really amazing how right now um, space exploration isn't just America and Russia anymore. Mm -hmm. You have Japan, you have India, and then you have so many other countries that are working on starting to get involved in, in building their own space agencies. Last summer I was lucky enough to be able to attend the um, International Space University program over in Graz, Austri Austria. And it was really amazing how many different countries of the world were sending their young rocket scientists. And that's literally what these people were, was fresh graduates out of college, uh, just finished their aerospace engineering programs, just finished their science programs, just finished basically getting their career started. And now they're getting sent to an international school to learn the politics, the science, the, the how-tos of getting into space, and this is a program that, that has graduated Whiteside of, of Virgin Galactic and many others who are in the modern commercial space agencies. And so I think that, tom that tomorrow's face of space is going to be radically different from the um, prior generation's vision of a bunch of old military guys gathered around building rockets out in, well, in the military base. Now it's going to be guys out in the Mojave Desert. Yeah, there's a statistic, I, I think, that like the average person working in mission control is like 26 years old, I think, is that it's a very young crowd now. It's taken, it's cool, right? I mean, you, you have to make space hip and, and get younger generations involved, and that's what's happening, so it's working out. Now, now one of the concerns that, that a lot of people have is the kids growing up today, they were kind of, well, the space shuttle was passe, it, it was something everyone just knew, it flew it and came back down, nothing to get excited about. They didn't have an Apollo landing, they didn't have any really big firsts in their generation, and there's a lot of concern that trying to get today's kids excited about space exploration is hard to do. And, and I know this is something that you're working on doing by, well, bringing robots, which I think everyone gets excited about robots. It's, it's not exactly dinosaurs and planets, but robots are right up there with things that, that people of all ages get excited about. Um, so, so your prize involves a robot going 500 meters or a rover or something else. Now, how are you trying to take this and communicate it to kids and get the excitement involved in the kids? Well, this is a good segue because, um, I mean, that's the very thing that we're trying to do. I think one of the reasons why Google um, is sponsoring this X Prize is because they want us to reach out to the public and get kids not only excited about space, but we want those kids to be the future leaders in space exploration. And so this project called Moonbots, or rather should I say this contest called Moonbots, it basically does that. Um, we are in our third year of the contest, and this was originally kind of the brainchild of Will Pomerantz, who was our um, 
our director for the Google Winner X Prize, and he kind of started these ideas, I, I want to say about three or four years ago. Then I came on a couple years ago, and we launched the first year of the contest. So basically what Moonbots is, is it's um, a challenge that emulates the Google Lunar X Prize. So we basically um, give uh, Legos to kids so that they can um, build a lunar surface, but they can also program a robot that's going to rove on the lunar surface. It's a gateway toy. Yeah. It, it, it is a gateway toy. So building a lunar surface out of Legos, um, they, they are, they're kind of shaped, they do have craters, many of them, that's how you put them together. Um, but, but describe more about what you mean about building the lunar surface out of Legos. This just sounds like way too much fun. I know. It, I mean, what could get better, Legos and rockets? I mean, it's, I mean robots, it's so great. So, so let me kind of just start from the very beginning. So um, registration for the contest is going to start on May 15th. We're going to be at First World Championship here next week on Thursday and Friday, which I believe is the 26th and the 27th, in St. Louis in the Lego booth promoting Moonbots. So anyone that's watching and wants to come and learn more, please come and visit Leo and I, and you'll get all kinds of crazy I'll information. I'll give you swag. It'll be really <laughs> fun. You'll get stickers and all kinds of stuff. So again, registration starts May 15th. If I can't say that enough, I'll keep saying it again. <laughs> so basically what we're doing is we're challenging teams of kids from the ages of 9 to 17 years old to form a team. A team basically is comprised of anywhere between two kids to five kids, and then we ask for one adult team mentor for that team. Um, once you form your team, we then ask you to put together um, a video about space exploration. And the themes of this uh, year's videos are going to be really, really fun. Um, basically, there's various topics all around um, the heritage artifacts on the moon and what should, we, what should we do with them and where should we go and all kinds of things like that. If you could put your own heritage artifact on the moon, what would it be? Now, now I, I want to stop you just there for for a moment. Um, one thing that, that I know was new to me is, is the, the concept of the lunar heritage policies and legislation that, that people are working on developing. Um, and I think everyone knows it's kind of awesome that there's footprints on the moon and that they have the potential to last forever. But I don't think a lot of people realize how fragile um, all those essentially museum artifacts we've put on the moon is. So, so could you take a moment to explain what the, the lunar heritage policy that people are working on is? So um, basically, I know that NASA is going to be releasing some information here. I think it's going to be actually at GLEX about guidelines that have to do with the lunar heritage artifacts and the way that um, the Google Lunar X Prize is going to be involved in that. Uh -huh. um, I don't want to say too much information because I don't know if that's for public release yet. <laughs> but what I can say is that oh, um, you. <laughs> <laughs> what I what I can say is is you know there's a lot of talk around this and basically. Right yeah. um, you know, who kind of owns these <laughs> heritage yeah. artifacts? Are we allowed to to go and, you know, no one wants us to go to the moon and, and rove over the footprint. Right, and, and not only that, but I mean, just getting near the, I mean, they've been just sitting there for how many, 40, 50 years? 40 years. 40 years, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we've got to see what happens when something sits on the lunar surface for 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, if you even land too close, who knows, it, the footprint may not even be there. We don't know. So, um, we have to do the best we can to preserve those sites, and, uh, and it is kind of just an act of mutual respect, right? Because there's no laws at the moment, uh, and now that you know commercial space is making its you know um, segue into onto the moon, uh, you know we have to start realizing what we're dealing with and what we can touch and what we want to preserve and things like that. So it's it's definitely a, a hot topic right yeah. now. And I know there's even been some talks, too, that, you know, where um, astronauts have brought back things, you know, from yeah. the moon that they had used. And so do they have rights to right. those kinds of things? I don't know if it was golf balls or journals or things like mm -hmm. that, but does NASA own that or do the astronauts yeah. own that? And can they sell it or can they not sell it? And so these are some of the questions that we want to raise and we want right. kids to kind of explore these topics and, and kind of get their input right. on it. And if you could leave anything on the moon, what would you leave? You know, yeah. that's that's... An interesting idea. 
Well, and, and it goes back to so much of, of the heritage we have in how we've explored space to date. With, with the Voyager missions, with the Pioneer missions, we, we were sending our image into space and, and basically saying, this is how you find us. Well, if you made it to the moon, you you've found humanity, basically. But you have to worry about, well, what is that future where maybe something bad happened on Earth and society on our planet was wiped out? What are we leaving on the moon? Maybe something happens and we lose our ability to travel to space for a while and then someday in the future people revisit the moon and have a wait. Society was here in the past. That would be really creepy. Um, but, but you can imagine these sorts of science fiction futures which unfortunately all involve bad things happening, but we have to speak to that potential future in what we do. And, and it's interesting that you're engaging kids in doing this. And how, how do you explain to a younger generation um, the idea of, of basically treating uh, what their grandparents did as archaeological sites? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think um, that's a really good question because do we, do we explain it to kids or do we let kids kind of discover that topic and explain it amongst themselves and form their own ideas and their own opinions around this very concept. So um, that's one of the goals for Moonbots this year is, is really getting kids to talk about, talk about these topics and just kind of see, you know, what the different opinions are about it. And it's an interesting place to be at. I mean, this is, you know, the first time in history where going to the moon is kind of a thing that kids are going to grow up with, right? Yeah. Uh, it was an adventure before and, and mankind was made crossing these thresholds and now it's you know, oh, there's, you know, we're still kids making robots to emulate a team that's making robots to go to the moon. We're doing it alongside them. So, you know, like you said, it's an archaeological uh, dig for them, even though their grandparents were involved with it. It's not that old, but it hasn't been accessible, at least not readily. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic, and to see how kids view that is kind of what this is all about. And, and one of the things I really love about, about what you're doing is it would be so easy to simply say to, to the competing teams, like they do with so many other robotics competitions, we're, we're getting ready to have um, the um, bot ball competition here on our campus this weekend, actually. And, and all these teams, are, they're highly engaged in robots, but it's robots, robots, robots must accomplish the task. Well, you have the robots, robots, robots must accomplish the task, but you're coupling it with thinking about culture and society and everything else and you're doing it within the social dynamic of getting them doing YouTube videos mm -hmm. and and this is part of how you judge the competition from what I understand right. so so in the past what sorts of things have really surprised you that you've seen come out of these kids teams um, oh man I, I have such a list but you know a couple things that really strike me you know when I when I started working on this contest I was really afraid that um, you know because the age range of 9 to 17 that's, that's a pretty good big yeah. gap and if you have children you know that a nine-year-old can be pretty different than a 17 year old and so I was really worried that we were going to have you know, these older teams come in and just Dominate, dominate crush. you know, <laughs> and that has not been the case because the little guys, I mean, they're they're, they're a little bit more free-minded. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're very, very creative. They're very, very opinionated and astute, and and they know robots. Yeah. So and um, they know the they know the competition uh, because the kids are like really interested in what's going on and they want to compete on that same level. Mm -hmm. Whereas the older teenagers may have heard about it and they're like, yeah, it's just something with people are landing on the moon. Anyways, we're building robots. Where kids are like, oh, I want to know what each team is doing and we want to build one like that team. And, you know, there's a little bit more uh, enthusiasm. So. Yeah. So age age really doesn't factor into the into the contest. So I would say that's probably the first thing that has kind of just surprised me. Um, and then the second thing is just really like the level of skills that these kids have. I mean, in terms of social media, we don't have to teach them anything. <laughs> They're teaching it's us. It's to them, yeah. <laughs> and so that's really fun. And then just really the whole like aspect of programming the Lego Mindstorm robots. Again, it's, it's not age dependent. Um, 
they know how to pro the, program the robots, and, and trust me, they try to figure out all kinds of like loopholes to the rules, and can they have this, and can they yeah. have that, and so um, it's it's really important for us to have our, our Lego leads on the contest, and kind of watch them every minute and everything they that they're doing, so those are probably the two, the two biggest um, factors. And, it, and it's interesting to see how they choose to outreach to the communities, too, like some of the things yeah. they put together, it's just like, it's mind-blowing, so. So, so. so explain. Oh, well, like, what was it you were telling me? When one team started their own science fair, it's not that they participated in one. They actually made a science fair for other people to join. So, and that coming from a little kid, like, how yeah. old was Yeah, I think that team was, the average age was, like, 11 years old. <laughs> 11 years old. Oh, what did you do? Oh, I graduated Harvard. What about you? I started science fair when I was 11. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. um... I can go on a little bit about more about the contest. Um, so, so I, I actually, so you're doing all of this on the Lego platform, um, and and the kids, they, they build the, the surface of the moon. Now, what sorts of challenges do you have the kids engaged in, and how does that compare to to the X Prize itself? How how do you decide how to bridge those two things together? Okay. So back to the first phase of the contest, we asked the kids to, to put together a four-minute video about, you know, all of the stuff with heritage artifacts. And then the other component that they have to do, which is completely different from the last two years, is we're asking them two questions. One is a technical question and one's a creative question. And the creative question is, is if they could put together a surface for a surface that emulated the moon out of Legos, what would it look like? In the past, we already had the moon surface design, but this year we're asking for kids about their input of what what would the ultimate surface be. So they have research has to go into yes. it, yeah. And so they have to give us ideas for that. And then um, the second question that we're going to be asking them is basically more technical. So would they involve solar power with their robot? How technical are they going to be in terms of involving the components of the actual GLXP competition? And we have some questions also related to the Night Rover Challenge um, as well. And so from there, we're going to pick 30 teams. Um, now, let me start over. As many teams as we want can enter the competition and compete in this phase. But then after phase one, we will select 30 teams. And this is really different from last year because last year we only accepted 20 teams to make it on to phase two. So now we're at 30 teams, so we're trying to, you know, go up, which is really good. And then from there, <laughs> from there, after we have the 30 teams, and that's kind of where the nitty-gritty starts, they're going to be um, building the surface of their moon based on what they said they wanted it to look like. So, so that'll be, be consistent. You yeah. know, they have to think about all the phases from the very beginning. Yeah. Now, now are you asking them in, in figuring out what the ultimate surface is, are you asking them to take into consideration what would be a scientifically interesting area, what would be a completely safe area, what would maximize ability to get sunlight, what sorts of considerations are going into, or do they simply have to justify their decision? I think it's more it's about the justification. It's the second. It's right? them justifying. We we really want to see creativity. Like I said, in the previous years, we we had it already designed, and this year, um, Lego is trusting the yeah. kids. <laughs> well, the problem so. and the problem too with having it designed already is people find out, you know, like everything else, a meta develops, and they figure out the easiest way to navigate the course, and it stops being about navigating the obstacles, and instead it becomes about navigating around them and just making the quickest times and not completing any tasks. So it's a race instead of a study. Um, yeah. With this, you know, in this they can, you know, obviously we can rate their difficulty of their task depending on what they choose. For example, like going and getting, uh, you know, the water ice from a crater that doesn't have exposure to the sun, that kind of thing. Um, it, it adds a different element and a create, creative tool. Yeah. So, so they have to both be artists in how they design their scientifically representative surface, which, which is a wonderful combination. And I've been hearing a new acronym lately, which is STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. And it sounds like you're bringing in that aspect of STEAM to the project as well. Now, once folks have their, their surface developed, their challenges developed, the LEGO Mindstorm allows you to do a whole lot of different things. And, and I've occasionally seen people do Lego Mindstorm on top of Roomba, 
what sorts of creative, crazy robotic things have you seen in the past and do you anticipate seeing in the future? Yeah, so yeah, we've, we've seen some crazy things. I mean, just in terms of the the lifts that the kids have put, you know, onto their robots. And um, I mean, you'll see arms. I can't really show it here, but I mean, you'll see arms on these Legos and be like this big. So, you know, anything is 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 out there. We're, we're prepared to see um, kids putting, you know, awesome, awesome wheels um, to having um, fun motors and maybe even incorporating solar panels this year on their, on really? their robot so that the solar panel will actually drive the robot rather than a battery. And, and I should do a shout out to one of our partners this year, which is basically called Dexter Industries. They um, put together and they've donated solar panels that actually fit on Lego Mine. That's, that's fabulous. <laughs> I can imagine being a kid and just going, wow, I have an actual solar panel that I'm yeah. putting on the robot that I built out of Legos. Now, kids here on Earth actually have a disadvantage in a way compared to robots on the moon because here on Earth, well, we have a day-night cycle that cycles every 12 hours at equinox and adjust from there. Um, whereas on the moon, you have this couple weeks of daylight, couple weeks of nighttime, now, the nighttime part tends to be death, but, but that couple weeks of daytime is extremely useful and, and it lets you get a whole lot more charge on you. Um, but you did mention the, the, the nighttime challenge that you have on the, the XPRIDE side of things. And can you explain the challenges of surviving that lunar night? Yeah, so I mean, one of those challenges would be if you decided to use solar power, how would you do this in the lunar night? And so again, I mean, I'm, 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 I probably seem like I'm being really vague, but one of the components of this year's contest is for kids to fill figure out these kinds right. of challenges. You know, again, in the past we've been really straightforward with the contest and we've set out, you know, certain criteria and the kids have been able to figure it out and more. And this year we're trying to basically develop the game so that there can be all these unique kinds of challenges like the lunar night and how are you going to deal with that. And so that might be the very theme of their actual game board. And right. we will be judging the contest based on that game board. So. I don't want to give away, again, too many answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I love about this is this is actually how real science missions work, where basically you come up with the, I want to go explore Europa, drill a hole in the surface, drop a robot through it, and explore the European oceans. Right. Or I want to build a robot, go land it on Mars, and dig in the soil. Different scientists come up with different creative ideas for the things they want to do. And all of these different ideas get thrown in a pot together and judged against each other with a matrix of we give this many points for science, we give this many points for uh, ready to fly technology. And, and so it gets complicated where sometimes safe sound and not as exciting wins over amazingly exciting but high, highly dangerous. And this is why we have different types of, of competitions to get real missions. Yeah. But you're essentially doing the exact same thing that professional scientists do, yeah. but with the high school kids. And, and that's really awesome. Yeah, well, starting that critical thinking uh, at the very beginning is crucial. I mean, yeah. You know, it's not just willy-nilly build a robot, here we go, we won. You know, it's, yeah. you've got to think about a lot of different things. Even just the density of the grains of sand, yeah. it's, it's insane. And we really want teams that have competed in Moonbots in the last two years to be able to come now into the third year of the contest and have something completely new to right. explore. So that way there's no unfair advantages to older teams to new teams now coming in. Now, one of the great things about the LEGO Mindstorm is it allows you to do everything from happy little on-wheels rovers to things that walk along. And do you see this sort of diversity in, in what's getting um, uh, built, or are they mostly sticking to more conservative rover-like things like we've sent to Mars? No, I think there's going to be I think there's going to be a lot of diversity because again this we're time. we're keeping it very very open. We're not constraining and saying okay your wheels only have to be you know um, 
these dimensions right. and things like that. So we're looking for some awesome, awesome, amazing robots. Right, and that's why we deviated away from the game board. Like I said, it becomes meta, and then they just figure out the fastest way to navigate it. And then, yeah. if the challenge is open, they have no you know, preconceived notion, and they have to create the challenge and then create a robot that will function within that challenge. You know, they're, they're creating their own problems. Mm -hmm. uh, which is easier than, uh, which is harder than us just handing it to them and figuring so, it out. So, well, yeah, so in a way, I mean, they're competing against other teams, but they're actually competing against themselves right. too. We're looking to they're see, themselves. yeah, what their ideas are and how way how well they'll be able to excel in the challenge that they are creating themselves. And and what's neat about how you're doing this is it, you're taking it from basically the, the pardon the pun, but I can't resist. You're taking it from being Star Wars Legos on Wii to being Minecraft on, on whichever server you're playing it on, where you go from the closed path to the, I'm going to build whatever I feel like today. Yeah. And, and that open-ended problem solving is, is really awesome. Now... On the NASA side of space, there, there's this long history of when you're developing a spacecraft, when you're developing a mission, a certain percentage of the funding gets set aside and dedicated to education and public outreach. I, I know this is what supports a lot of the things I do. Now, there's, there's no reason for Google Lunar X Prize to have this same, well, we're going to fund all of this awesome actual go and explore space stuff, but we're also going to spend money on high school kids. What's the history of this awesome project? Well, again, I mean, I think it goes back to what I said in the beginning. I mean, Google was really interested, I think, in supporting this prize, one, to see the technologies that were going to come about from our teams competing, but also just the outreach that we were going to be able to do with this prize and basically um, getting the, that next generation of kids excited about space exploration. You know, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to start in college. It, it can start when you're five years right. old. And so that's really, really important to us is to not only teach kids about the Google Lunar X Prize, the teams that are competing, but give them ways and means for them to be involved and really be involved in STEM education and have these hands-on learning experiences. I, I mean, when I, I can speak on behalf of X Prize, that's really important to us, but I also know for Google, it's really important to them. Right. And it's also important, I mean, if you're going to land on the moon, that's wonderful, and it will create an industry, and it will advance technology, um, but it's not quite as potent unless, you know, people know about it. And that's kind of the whole thing is reach out there and make people aware that you're going to be landing on the moon commercially for the first time. This is a big deal. This is going to change industry. It's going to change. His, everything's going to change, right? The way we live will change because of this. And there are people that don't even know it exists, and they need to be made aware of it. Yeah. And if you get kids excited, not only will people be aware, but they'll start working on future generations of these concepts, and, and it will just, you know, develop the... Uh, the technology and then the whole mindset will just, you know, kind of become a natural generational shift. Yeah. Now, I, I have one final question for you, and then I'm going to start taking questions from the feed. And, and my question, and I'm going to ask you to guess, and you may not be able to answer this, is, well, people are always asking, when's NASA going to land on the moon again? And I'm going to ask you, when is it that this random Joe who may be a university student is most likely to land on the moon with their robot? In the year. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> can, can you label a yeah. decade? <laughs> I'll take a decade at this point. Say within the next decade. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You know, that, that's... Within the next couple of years. Yeah, I yeah really honestly. Do. Yeah. I really do. That's a very realistic uh, yeah. portrayal. Yeah. That that's really awesome. Now I think so far my my favorite comment from the comments feed is from Scott Lewis who writes, "Haha, sounds like you're cultivating a generation of mad scientists, which is full of win." And and I have to agree that that's entirely true. It's it's part of science is hacking and getting covered in in gear grease and and discovering nasty words because your robot just decided to shred itself. It's part of growing up to have have. I set a computer on fire when I was trying to build right. and build and one. You can see that in so many different industries. I mean, you look at look at the video game industry. It started as a, a box with 8-bit graphics. Now it's the largest industry in the world. But you put it in front of people, you make it a cool thing, and boom, you know, it becomes the way things are. Hey, we're in the EA building, so <laughs> we're living proof. <laughs> so, so Scott also goes on to ask, this, this isn't your first year, have you actually seen measurable changes in attitude of the kids who've participated in this so far? Yeah, we have. We have. Um, one of the things that we've, we've seen 
like I said, we've seen um, the contest reach kids just in terms of different ages. But I think, you know, looking at from year one to year two, the teams that have competed from year one to year two, you can definitely see just the, the knowledge of space exploration. That, that has definitely increased and kind of their passion mm -hmm. for space exploration. You can see a change from year one when they make the videos to year two. I mean, they know so much. It's, it's just, yeah. it's just yeah. unbelievable. They're, they're summing up this competition in ways that we, we didn't even see. I mean, they're like, oh my God, we didn't even think of that, or you know, they just they just understand. It's just intuitive to them. They just it know is. it's just part of their their technological, uh, na digital native <laughs> style. Yeah. Yeah. Now, are are most of the the school? Are, I'm biasing my answer. Are most of the the groups of kids coming from schools, scouting groups, after school programs? Where are these kids getting drawn from? And and if if you're a dad of a Nine and twelve year old. I know you don't go down to eight and younger, but let's say nine and older. Can you have a sibling group join this? How? How? What are the limitations on defining a group? So basically, a group just has to be two kids, <laughs> and it anything. can be your brother, it can be your sister, it can be your next door neighbor, it can be anyone. It can be someone from a Boy Scout troop, a Girl Scout troop. It could be a team that's already competed as part of maybe First Lego League or the First Robotics. Um, first robotic teams, um, and we've had various groups compete. So we've had kids in after school programs, and we've had actually kids like in a classroom. So um, it can be anyone. It can yeah, you can even ask, uh, you know, Angelina Jolie if you can borrow one of her kids, I'm sure she'll win you one. <laughs> you can get them from anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I, I don't think I'm exactly in a position to start borrowing Angelina Jolie's kids, but but I may de decide. We've got plenty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my university, um, I know, has a bunch of Lego Mindstorm kits that we loan out to, to regional schools. So if you're in the southern Illinois, uh, greater St. Louis area, we've got Lego Mindstorm kits. And NASA provides training for teachers on how to use LEGO Mindstorm kits through free teacher pro professional development online. Um, there, there's resources for you. Look around in your area. I, I know one of the concerns a lot of schools face because of the realities of, of the economy, um, they just don't have money to get yeah. LEGO Mindstorm kits for their schools. And I'm really, really, really glad you've asked this question because one of the best things about this contest is it's absolutely free to join. When I say it costs zero dollars, it costs zero dollars. To enter the contest costs nothing. To put together a video really just takes some time for you to put that together. And then if you make it into phase two of the contest, all of the materials and the Lego Mindstorm robot is actually sent to you. That's now, awesome. now, let's say you don't make it into the second phase of the contest. You could still do your own Mindstorm, the second part of the contest, if you had a Lego Mindstorm robot and kind of just do it, you know, with your school friends and things like that. Um, so again, it's free, free, free. And the other thing that's really important that a lot of people, I always assume that people know this, but they don't, is you don't have to travel anywhere. So wow. the contest can actually, it's done in your backyard, it's done in your house, it's done in your local school. When the kids are actually competing and showing the challenge, they're basically, you know, using some kind of online platform system, whether that's Skype or Google Plus or something like that, and they're broadcasting it to us that way. So it costs no money, you don't have to travel anywhere, um, and I think that's really important to, for everyone to know. So if your school is between doing a bot ball competition and doing a moon bot competition, bot ball requires you to travel. Yeah. So you just, you just sold me on why this is an awesome program. I need to work on getting people locally engaged in. Well, and it's a good program because we reach kids like I said, from all over the world. So you'll have kids in Malaysia competing against kids in Canada that are competing against kids in England. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing to Cup see. Yeah, it's the World <laughs> Cup of Moonbots. You know, it's it's really really fun. Now, it, are there forums uh, or is um, everything done through Facebook? How do the kids get to to Meet other geek kids. I know growing up as a geek kid, that was always a problem. Is there's just too few of us nerds on the planet. So, so how are you getting the global nerd community intermixed? So the kids, the kids 
there will be a forum on our Moonbots website and through Facebook where the kids are able to talk to each other and kind of learn from one one another. And um, it's really fun because they'll share each of their their Twitter accounts and their Facebooks. And so they they definitely talk to each other and it and Sometimes they'll share a little information, and sometimes yeah. they'll share a lot of information. It depends we how really want competitive they are. We, we want yeah. them to be vocal and be online and, yeah. and talk to GLXP and Moonbots, too, because mm -hmm. we'll promote them as well. I mean, if they have a great idea or they say something clever or funny or have a cool picture, yeah, we're going to cool slap video. it up all over the web. I mean, we'll yeah. want people to see it. That's so, awesome. Um, they want to be web famous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, now the, t the question I know our local teachers are going to ask is, do they get to keep the Mindstorm kits after the competition? Yes. They get to keep the Mindstorm kits. They will receive what I call a Moonbots media kit that will have a Moonbots flag, and it will have stickers and all kinds of advertisement materials um, that they can use to promote their team. And then the last thing that I didn't say is there's really some cool prizes. So we're going to be awarding some um, first team registrations, and then the grand prize um, winning trip, which we just kind of got confirmation on it, is going to actually be in Hawaii. At the, it's called Pisces, but it's basically Pisces is the Pacific International Space Center for Exploration Systems. And no, so, no big deal. Yeah, so we'll be uh, <laughs> sending kids out there during the holiday break if they, they win the ultimate grand prize, and um, they'll be able to do a bunch of cool things with robots. So, so deadlines to register is coming up. Um, after registration, you put your video together, submit the video, get selected. Is this a summer project? Is this going to stretch into the next school year? What's your final timeline look like beyond May fifteenth? Uh, so registration will start and reg registration will start May 15th and registration in November the kids then will then start telling us where they're going to actually do their live demonstration so are they going to do it at their home are they going to do it at their school for their Boy Scout troop are they going to go to the mall and like you know show their robot to amazing people out there so um, they'll tell us where they're going to do their live demonstration and then we'll start pushing it through right. our social media challenge so the public can see what these cool robots look like and how they're able to, to do their challenge. That's, that's really awesome. Um, but between this and then the forum you have coming up for all of the, the real world XPRIZE people, it sounds like the next year is going to be a whole lot of people building community around our future exploration of the moon. And that jet car future that we were all told about as kids, it looks like you're helping today's uh, kids build that jet, scar, jet car future. Out of Legos, no less. <laughs> out of Legos. Yeah. All you need to do is include a cat somehow. Legos, cats. Well, on the internet, you're famous. That's, <laughs> it, that's exactly. Outreach to cats, but they don't let <laughs> So, so this has been a really, really great discussion. I'm, I'm not seeing a, a lot of, of comments coming in on, on the internet, um, but I am seeing a lot of plus ones. And um, I, I'd love to know what, what final thoughts do you have as, as I look for the final questions to come in? I would just say to have people check us out um, on our Moonbots website page, which is www.moonbots.org. Um, and you'll see information about how right. to register and what the competition and is And it's in about. the process of being updated as well. So yeah. you'll, see, you'll see news flashing up every, yeah. every now and then. And and, also, and oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, and I was just going to say, and GLXP on Twitter, kudos for the four-letter Twitter handle. That rocks. Okay. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great feed that shares more than just Google Lunar X Prize. There, yeah, there's a lot of good lunar science on there. Yeah, and I, pers I personally manage that. So, I mean, if, if you message GLXP, you're talking to me. So, um, you know, share ideas and thoughts. And, you know, I, I'm trying to build the space community more than that. I mean, I came into this as a casual space fan, and now, obviously, I'm integrated, and I love it. And so I like seeing other people that are just trying to get things going. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're open to that. We want to share that. So. And, and I, I think that ends us on a wonderful note. The, the space community is one that I'm learning. The, the commercial space agencies in particular are a whole bunch of people just trying to build a rocket car future that embraces as broad a swath of society as possible. 
the community is thinking about education, they're thinking about social media, and they're engaging people as much as they can. And that matches what we're doing here at CosmoQuest. Yeah, and, and just do it. Just yeah, just. Awesome. Yeah. And, and so we'd like to thank all of you who have been here listening. This, this has been CosmoQuest's weekly science hour. And we're here every week, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we apologize for not listing more time zones, but the planet is sorting itself out into daylight savings time right now. Yeah. And um, I, I hope that we will con continue to see you in the future as we bring you new topics, new ideas. And when you're not learning science, don't forget you can be doing science. Over at CosmoQuest, we currently have a project, Moon Mappers, that invites you to help a team of scientists, well, work on exploring our moon. and defining what are the scientifically interesting places that tomorrow's rovers can land and explore that can be discovered by you. So get involved on all sides. Build robots, take over the world, get on CosmoQuest, explore the moon, and figure out where you're going to take over next. Awesome. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful. It was really fun. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.